Welcome, Nico. Hi, Daniel. Thank you for this. Um, to start off with, very kind of uh, simple question, but as a co-founder and CTO of Otto, um, how have you found the, the first couple or first few years? Just to sign up. That's a constant roller coaster. Yeah. It's very difficult. Um, it brings you a lot of joy. Uh, well, it's, it's, so it's blood, sweat, and tears. Yeah. Uh, but it's amazing, you know, we don't do anything else. Um, I've just found that the more problems you solve, the more problems crop up. Uh, but that's what, like, what makes the fun of it. Um, and you become good at, or better essentially, at handling the unexpected. Mm -hmm. Because everything is always unexpected. Yeah. So I think, uh, can I just jam and yeah, say yeah, that? Fine, yeah. Okay, so Eric Kreis in the, what is called the Lean Startup Cycle Converse, mm -hmm. um, defines a startup as, not quoting literally, but something like this, um, <clears throat> a project or an, an endeavor, essentially, that operates in conditions of extreme uncertainty. So the idea is that you're going to try and do something that very few people have done, or no one has done before. Usually no one has done it in this particular setting. Mm -hmm. And so you have no idea if it's going to work. And so there's always a remote chance that it, that it might work, and that it will work, if you are relentless, and if you allow yourself to fail often. And that's a cliche, you get yeah. it, like fail often, fail fast, etc. Yeah. But it's actually true. Um, to me, building a startup is starting with a vision in mind and, and setting a course, and then uh, after a few days and a few weeks, and essentially a, a few times a week, yeah. realizing that things are not happening as they should or as you thought they would, and then changing course, like adjusting your course little by little, repeatedly, and sometimes very frankly, yeah. um, all of a sudden. And Is that something you knew you was going to need to do, or did you learn very quickly? Well, I'm, first, I'm not saying that I, I can do this, yeah. but I'm yeah. learning. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and Otto is the biggest thing I've built so far with Dil, my co-founder. Mm -hmm. um, but I've had previous experience in, in, in creating a, a tech startup and an NGO, and that's also what I've realized then. Mm -hmm. uh, always expect the unexpected. Yeah, yeah. That's good. I think, uh, what would you have done differently so far? You said you're still learning. But if you could go back and start again, is there anything you would do differently in a different approach? Yeah. Um, go to market as fast as possible, as early as possible. Get uh, proof points on your technology, uh, ideally yesterday. Mm -hmm. Get customer feedback uh, yesterday. Yeah. Uh, Oh, so I, I, have an, <laughs> I have an iPhone, is very new. I got it a few days ago and uh, yeah, I haven't quite completed it. But you can edit this up, right? No, it's okay. So That's fine. Things, that, things I would do differently. Um, yes, yeah, so get customer feedback yep. uh, very fast. Um, well, th this is a difficult one. So listen to your customers, even when you don't know who your customers are. And even when you know that they might not know exactly what they want, but still listen to them so, and try to guide them into telling you what they don't know they should tell you, yeah, if that yeah, makes sense. Yeah. So essentially, yeah, have uh, very quick feedback cycles between you and your customers. And that's something that I think we, I could have done better. Yeah. yeah. No, no. Interesting, interesting. Um, in regards to the last couple of years and, and starting Otto, what have been the standout moments for you? Um, good or bad? Uh, both. And there's been some, there's been some tough moments. Uh, well, yeah, I'll start with the good moments. When something works, when you deploy something and it starts working, uh, it feels amazing. In the very beginning, uh, I was alone uh, on the tech side, and then we were very few, and everything felt like a big thing. And then I became a bit more. Um, detached from mm -hmm. the actual development, um, but the feeling remains when we build something and ship it, uh, and it starts working. Uh, it feels really amazing. So essentially, every product launch, every launch with a customer has felt great. Um, there's moments of elation, essentially, when um, when you realize that 
your technology works in the way that you expected, but also in ways that you didn't expect, and this happened quite a few times and it's amazing. When you can raise money, because um, because it helps, yeah, um, and uh, but that also leads me to the difficult moments. I'd say there were quite a few times in the past two and a half years now where <laughs> where I thought it was it was over essentially yeah. because yeah. we were uh, approaching the end of our runway. We essentially we had almost no money left, mm -hmm. and we were in this due diligence process with investors, but everything was taking longer. And uh, at least twice, I thought, okay, that's it. We've had a good run. <laughs> We've tried. I enjoyed it. Uh, yeah, it was amazing. And, you know, yeah. some things are not uh, meant to work. And I've tried, though. I've tried really hard, and that's mm. it now. Uh, and then it's, it, it's, it isn't it. Uh, yeah. But still. The, it Surely is, that's the best moment, then. When you feel like that, and then that moment where you think, actually, no. Yes, It's exactly. back going that, well again. That's why it's coupled. And I think the more you grow... Uh, and again, we, we're quite small. We're just under 20 people now. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but the more you grow, the more you feel this, the pressure to succeed, because it's not only your job, it's not only your vision and your dreams and everything, uh, it's just the lives of the people you work with yeah. and people who work nights sometimes to make something work and to build cool stuff. And then the moment when you have to tell them if it comes one day, uh, well, you know what, guys, you, you tried hard. We all tried hard. It's, it's just not going to work. Oh, man, that, would, that would break my heart. I think. Yeah, that, yeah. that would be really difficult. I suppose the aim, I suppose, is as you grow and different areas of business grow, you will, in a way, have less pressure because surely at that point you're going to have people that you can then delegate that to in a way and take it in, in a way like a backward step allow them to kind of take responsibility for that and if you have immense trust in those people surely that would ease that that feeling not soon obviously but uh, that's what i thought and yeah. it's not like that yeah uh, because of course you can delegate and for example if there's a bug right now in a production system and i'm aware of it uh, I know that I'm not going to be the one fixing it yeah. uh, because there's very good people on the team uh, who can do this. Um, but then again, there's many more things. So this, these are things I've delegated, but there's many more things that are on my shoulders as a CTO, on Taylor's shoulders as a CEO. Yeah. And it's just um, essentially, like, like I said before, the more problems you solve, the more crop up. Well, the more things you delegate, the more things you have to do. But an advisor told me once, um, he told me, as you grow and you mature, you have to be less in the business and more on the business. Mm -hmm. And this is what happens after a few years where you realize that you're less operational, yeah. you're less into the ins and outs of everything, uh, but you're, you're more, you're, you spend more time thinking, thinking about how things are going, are we on time, what are the metrics that we should optimize for? Um, how are we doing? And how can we continue moving forward? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so this is something that changes. Yeah. yeah. Nice. I get that. I get that answers your question. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. Um, it will lead me on to something now. So part of the success I can see you guys have had is in your content. What you do differently to a lot of startups in the Zurich area is you allow uh, the network to see what working for Otto would feel like, yeah. um, what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. For me, what that does is it, it gives kind of an insight into how someone would feel working here. And more importantly, I suppose, you feel like you know you and Tio to a certain degree because you've seen so much content. That's how I feel. First of like, Good. first time I meet you, but I feel like I've seen a lot of you anyway. Um, so first of all, where did that all come from? Whose idea was that? Well, first, I'm really happy to know that I've now met the person who watches the episodes <laughs> of LinkedIn. No, we actually, we do have more than one person. <laughs> yeah. um, so, where did the idea come from, Yemen? Yes, yeah, yeah. Well, actually, from Teo. Mm -hmm. Teo had a friend who told him about this content marketing idea, and he was, I think, he was uh, receptive to it, and he knew this entrepreneur uh, called. I'm not going to quote his name. Can you? Um, it's not something, I can't, I can't remember his name, so yeah, I'm not going to yeah. say, you'll have to edit this out. Why not check or something? Yes, but please, I know, in please the US. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. This is all the record because uh, I'm, I'm misspelling his name. Anyway, so Theo had <coughs> these ideas 
Um, and he thought, he said, okay, let's just try it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not going to cost us much money. And the, the potential upside is really big in terms of credibility, in terms of new business that we might get, in terms of, you know, just essentially showing who we are. Mm-hmm. Because everything happens behind closed doors in a corporate world, especially you enter a, a company and uh, you're there and everything that happens inside isn't communicated to the outside and we want it to, so for me the way I am at work and the way I am in life is essentially the same yeah um, I'm just the same guy yeah and that's why I don't wear shirts and everything and uh, that's I think that's how ideally work should be um, yeah. of course there's more structure processes etc but um, we wanted to, to show people that that, that's how a startup can be. And also, what we build is objectively like really, really cool. Yeah, like yeah. allowing machines to get um, empathy, to understand yeah. emotions, and do this in real time. So allowing like new robots to essentially change the way we communicate with machines. Yeah. And I wanted to show how it's done behind the scenes. Because mm-hmm. you often hear things about AI that can do this, it can do that, etc. What you don't see is the people who build it. Yeah. We thought, okay, well, we have a good... Uh, brand, potentially a good brand, uh, nice things to talk about, and we want to show it to the world, so let's do this. Yeah. We started uh, as a, with a pilot project, I think, of a couple of months. We made a few videos, mm-hmm. we had some good feedback. Uh, we realized that some outlets are good and some are less good. I think Instagram, for example, doesn't really work for us. Yeah. Facebook, not so much either. LinkedIn is really good, mm-hmm. um, and so we decided to, at the moment we're refining the, the strategy, we're trying to understand what works, what doesn't. We've actually hired someone here in Zurich who does this like, most of her time. Uh, she's okay. creating yeah. content and, and looking at the impact and the feedback on our content. Um, and yeah, so I, I must say I'm quite happy with it. With I think it's feedback. good. I, I think from my side, I had a candidate probably about a year ago now that we were working with and he interviewed with you guys and he was based in, it might have been Latvia or, or somewhere oh, like yeah. that. And he was, he got through to a final stage and you were completing that final stage via Skype. And because of the content and the videos, he, if he had been offered the job, would have been willing to join having never come here. Um, and I think that's the power of that really. That's rare. Um, normally uh, traveling across to Zurich seeing the area, seeing the office environment, meeting all yeah. of the, the kind of colleagues that they'd be working with, getting a feel for everything would be essential and that deciding factor. Absolutely. Whereas he was willing to say, you know what, I, I feel already like I know what it would be like and therefore I'd be happy to join. Well, it's great to hear and I'm sorry it didn't work with this particular yeah, candidate. you never know in the future. Well, I remember vividly. <laughs> uh, yeah. But yeah, I hope this will happen in the future again. Yeah, yeah, you never know. But no, it's definitely... Um, something that helps me as well a lot of the time with what we do we're awesome. we're speaking to candidates and we're trying to tell them that it will be like this work in there but words are words uh, and and at the back of their mind they're probably thinking yeah of course he's going to say this of course he's going to say how cool it is of course he's going to say how relaxed the office environment is and how innovative they are but if they can watch it with their own eyes i think in your old office you used to put a camera at the end of the meeting table yeah, sometimes yeah and just film a meeting and just have like a just a, a yeah. snippet of that. <laughs> I don't think these are the most entertaining Not the most videos. exciting. <laughs> but it just shows the yes. day-to-day work. And, um, and I mean, of course, we say, okay, we're a cool company and everything, because I think we are. Um, but the best thing is actually for people to work, maybe see it on yeah. you and then come and experience the, the vibe in the office. Uh, we try to, we just try to be nice in general. Yeah. While being, you know, professionals, because we have to build something and yeah. this pressure and everything. But, um, I think people are happy here. And I suppose with what you guys do, the office environment has to be like this. If it was more corporate and more regimented, I don't think it would work. Well, I think if it was more corporate, I don't think I would be working here. Because uh, yeah, yeah. I don't think I could do this again. Yeah. And also, okay, but it's, it's, it's always a collaborative effort. Um, everyone makes the office feel the way it feels. Mm-hmm. And so everyone brings something uh, special. Company values in a way. Uh, well, so values is something different. Yeah. Uh, but we have someone in the office 
and I'm not going to name him, but he will recognize himself, yeah. who makes cakes, amazing cakes, a couple times a week. Yeah. And that's obviously, that's not something I decided or even encouraged. And now I do, of course, because I love yeah. it. <laughs> But, um, <laughs> and it's something he does, and, and that's something like at 10 a.m. Uh, twice a week, uh, we meet and have cake. Um, wow. And it's just something that happens. He's after a rise. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and then we have someone else, and her thing is to decorate the office, and she, uh, last year she decided to get plants for the office and plant tomatoes and I think uh, chilies and a few things. And obviously this got nothing to do with me. Yeah. Um, so I think oh, everyone I makes the bring something to the to the office environment. So, um, I worked with an office in Vetsicon. Uh, yeah. I worked for business in, in Vetsicon. And they had this thing in place that someone just had this idea and thought it up where they had an office of about 40 people. And every time any one of those people went on holiday, they had to take a selection of photos. They used to come back, uh, provide their colleagues with a selection of these photos, and they'd have a vote on which one would go in a frame and go on the wall. No way. And underneath it, they'd have the, the person's name, the location and the year. Okay. Um, and it was such a good idea. I, I suggested it to our office actually, but we didn't have enough wall space, too many windows and, and stuff about. But too many it was, it, yeah, but it was, it was a great idea though, because it was nice pictures all over the wall, all kind of very artistic and from all over the world. But it's a personal touch, and it almost makes it feel like it's home from home in a way. That, and that, that, that's great, it's something we could do, some, like some version of it, and that's what defines company culture. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are things that are spontaneous, they just happen. Yeah. There are things also that can be not enforced, but uh, guided. Yeah. Yeah. And you were talking about values, and yes, so as a company we, we do have values. Um, and they, but, and, and they, they work. I mean, we work with them in, in a fairly like uh, quantitative way, because we have these uh, quarterly reviews with every employee where we discuss how they, um, how their behavior, their attitude sort of matches with the values that we have, mm -hmm. and they're not set in stone. Like we just changed one, for example, a few months ago, yeah. uh, and then we get feedback on on what they mean, etc. And essentially, they're around. Again, it's a bit cliche, but uh, not really. They're around um, communication, so feedback. One of them is feedback is gold. Mm -hmm. So any anytime you have to, you want to say something to someone, and especially if they're your superior, uh, or uh, if it's not easy to talk to them, there's a space and there's a certain way in which you can say, hey, there's something I want to share with you. Uh, is now a good time, and you explain, etc. Mm -hmm. um, and and we. Encourage, and we, so we, we created a space in which feedback is possible from anyone to anyone. Really, yep. uh, things about um, collaboration, team spirit, uh, getting out of your comfort zone, and, and so these are things that every quarter for everyone we assess essentially. Review it, yeah. Uh, and we say, okay, so this is how how you've been doing with yeah. regard to our values, uh, because. Okay, so it's another thing, but we, we want auto to be, we, we call it a catalyst for personal growth. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that uh, people should become better, not technically, but sort of more uh, apt mm -hmm. human beings, would you say this? Yep, yep. Um, by, um, through their time at auto. And so if we, we have quite a few junior people in the team, and for me, the best thing would be if one of these people, after a few years, and that's not happened yet, but it will happen, tells me, well, you know what, I've really loved my time here, and thanks to this, I've just found a great job, mm -hmm. and this is really the next step for me in my, on my career path, and I'm very thankful for what, for what I've learned, and I'm going to leave. Yep. And if I can see that through their time at Auto, they've learned something and acquired a means to move ahead, Mm -hmm. then it will feel amazing. So yeah. that's yeah. this personal growth thing. Ultimately, that, if that's happened, the business has benefited from having that person on board anyway. So it's kind of like everyone's, Absolutely. everyone's one, and then you go and do it again. Exactly. It's a win-win thing. Yeah. This yeah. person essentially always leaves something behind in a way. Um, so, so that has to do with culture again. Yeah. Yeah. And then new people come in, and the thing is like a shell, essentially. So a shell changes all the time. Um, so, was, so was, can I say something more? Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Last time we were, we had this uh, end of year retreat, and I tried to. I was talking about complacency and how 
we, <laughs> this is going to kill my job, to tell people that the house is on fire and uh, there's always an urgency and we always need to be faster, etc. Yeah. And, <clears throat> and, but it also has to do with, with culture. I told them, so I used to work in the corporate world for a bit and I felt like it was walking through the corridors of that company and it felt great. I mean, people were super friendly and stuff. Um, but it felt like the company was there, regardless of whether I was, okay? The company existed. And uh, the, the corridors were wide, and the ceiling was high, and I, so the, the, the structure existed, uh, in spite of me, in a way. Now, and, and I, I compared this to a startup, um, Otto here, and I told the team, <laughs> Uh, it was uh, a and I, I compared this to a startup, and I told the team, well, um, here, we essentially we carry the walls. Think of it as a tent, okay? Um, uh, there's no poles in it or anything, you carry the tent. And so as you move, essentially, and as you grow, it is the people who make the house or the tent. Um, so it's not like, it, it doesn't exist if you're not there. You are the company, it doesn't make sense. So and for me, that's, that's a big difference between a, a corporation and they have great corporations, of course, uh, and a startup because yeah. everyone is the company, and the yep. company is yep. everyone. Yep, yep, yep. No, I, I, I get that. I like that. I suppose in the values as well, you could add cake making cake to that. That could be something you could. Uh, yeah, yeah. Value is sharing in these cases. Yeah. Uh, and cake making is one way. They can make the cake and share it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah. And uh, I've been told this person could be promoted to chief cake officer. Yeah, I think so. Anytime soon. Yeah, that. yeah, that's going through the great value of Italia. Yeah. Excellent. Um, from an outsider's point of view, and, and for myself really, looking at the videos you've posted, speaking to you and Tio, um, I think you're quite similar. Uh, but I know that, that that can't be the case. One's, you're doing very different roles in the business. And ultimately, I think you need to have different views on things in order for something to work. Where are you both different and, and how? Well, one of us is much better looking, of course. <laughs> um, no, we're very different because first, we have different backgrounds, mm -hmm. family backgrounds, yeah. personal histories, and of course, sort of academic backgrounds. Theo is a, he's an essentially a born entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. He, after his studies, he went into building businesses uh, quite fast uh, and on the opposite, I was a very idea-oriented person, very theoretical in many ways, and I did research for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I cared about big questions, and Theo cared about solutions. Mm -hmm. So these are very different mindsets. However, um, we complement each other very much. So he's the business guy, and I'm the yeah. tech guy, yeah. and we're building a tech startup, so you need both, obviously. Yeah. Um, but we, we complement each other in many ways, in that um, working with him, I've learned many things about well, the daily hustle, essentially, mm -hmm. uh, and how to build productive relationships with people in a business context, um, and how to get to quick solutions. And Theo has learned, I think, well, I can't speak for him, of course, but he's learned more about um, technology. Mm -hmm. And the fact that anything that appears to work magically is the result of uh, a lot of effort and struggling yeah. in the in the background. Yeah, it hasn't just appeared. <laughs> and in fact, no. But actually, we the two say this often. Like we're kind of similar in the fact that we believe in things bigger than ourselves, not in a religious sense or anything, but maybe mm -hmm. even. Um, and uh, we're very optimistic uh, always. And then the one, when one feels a bit down, the other's here to say, hey, you know, it's, it's going to be fine. Mm -hmm. And the other way around. Um, and we have shared values around humanity, I suppose. Like yeah. our common humanity, like all of us. And uh, the picture we have for the future of society, uh, the role that technology can play in it, a um, bit of a realistic approach to where technology can lead us as well. Yep. Um, and we, we meet essentially halfway on, on many topics and that works really well. But I think Provide in a way what the other one lacks in yeah. a way. That's what works. Yeah, and uh, yeah. Nice, excellent. Um, so far, how have you found growing the team? So by that I mean finding the people and ultimately getting them on board and keeping them on board. 
I find that it's easier now than it used to be. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so first, um, well, it depends actually. Um, so I'm based in Zurich most of the time, and this is where I've been again on north, but really most of the time for the past ten plus years. So I do know enough people so that when something is available, then uh, I often know people who know people, and then there's a profile that comes up. So yeah, yeah. Um, a few people at Otto came through like direct or indirect connections, and a few people came through um, events that we had, also just the website, the videos sometimes. Yeah. yeah. So far, at the moment, I find that in Zurich, we are doing okay. If we were to say, if we do a new fundraising round, it's, it's a bit bigger, and we have to hire like 20 people very fast, uh, that would be tough. Yeah, yeah. That would be tough because there is a pool of talented people, um, but finding so many, like dozens at once, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, is difficult because it's competition for talent, of course, and yeah. there's big tech companies in Zurich hiring like crazy. But I think then the, the biggest challenge would be to onboard them and um, make it so that it doesn't alter the company culture drastically. So it's much easier, I find, to onboard people little by little. Yeah. Um, so, and I'm saying it's, we're doing okay now in Zurich, um, but it was more difficult in the beginning, because mm -hmm. in the beginning, first, responsibilities were not so clear, and we would hire people who do essentially everything. Um, and it's difficult. It's more difficult to hire for this. Uh, it's more difficult also to sell a vision when all you have is the vision. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when you have a product, when you have people, when you have an office, etc., it's much easier. Um, so I find that it's it's become easier, um, but not everywhere. So we've we've opened an office in Lisbon um, at the end of last year, and we now have five people there. Um, but it wasn't super easy to find really good profiles. Like yeah. Technically, we found some good engineers. We have people who do product and, and uh, full, full, full stack. Yeah, 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 yeah. Full stack front end. Um, and technically, like, people who fit uh, the desired profile, we, we found quite a few. But uh, people who could work well with the rest of the team, people who could uh, fit the culture, mm -hmm. not so easy. So you mentioned about the office in Lisbon. Um, why, why did you set up there? Well, first, why are we in Zurich? We're in Zurich because uh, it's a... What, were you going to ask that? Oh, uh, sorry, did I say Zurich? I mean yeah. Lisbon. Yeah, uh, but I, yeah so I was going to, uh, to answer your question. To start off by why you're here. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay. So we should answer that first then. Yeah, do that first. Okay, why so we're in Zurich. Because it's a great place to build a machine learning team in general, mm -hmm. or sort of deep tech uh, team. Because first, I lived here, and I again, there's a bit of a network thing, but also proximity to very good academic institutions. Yeah. Uh, and, and Switzerland is quite small anyway, so someone who's worked, say, in Lausanne at EPFL can easily come to Zurich. Um, it's very attractive. Uh, people want to come here. I think it's been ranked the city in the world with the highest quality of life yeah. for like the eight times in a row, something like this. Uh, so obviously, it's a great place to live in. And you know, you, you just said earlier, like coming here in the summer, you feel yeah, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so all of this makes it a great place to build a tech team. But there are things that um, are not easy to find in Zurich, or they're not easier to find in Zurich than in, in other places. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, in general, sort of full stack engineering, um, front-end stuff, uh, product. And so we realized at some point that there were just things we were not very good at. We had really great, like deep technology, machine learning, AI stuff. Uh, but our products essentially didn't look very good. Yeah. Uh, UX, etc. Yeah. And so we started scouting uh, places and we had our site set on potentially Berlin mm -hmm. or Barcelona yeah. or Lisbon. Um, and we ruled out Berlin and Barcelona a bit arbitrarily um, well, because now the market is quite saturated. It's, yeah. it's just harder to find people. And Lisbon has lots of, lots of talent still. Um, some expats, so it's quite international, quite vibrant, mm -hmm. um, and so lots of really good people, really good developers, and uh, but it's also cheaper than Zurich, essentially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, I, I thought that would come into it in a way, uh, but 
no, I understand that about the finding different talent and, yeah. and different areas being good for that. And like you say, the, the universities in Switzerland, especially EPFL and ETH, they, they help enormously. They yeah. don't help, they help at me, they help us, because it means that there's a large talent pool in, in Zurich and in Lausanne, for example, uh, and in Switzerland as a whole. Uh, but what we do also find is that people know those people. They have links to businesses already and, and oh, yeah. startups. So then naturally it's quite organic. They find their own people, which then takes away the need for us. But then it also allows us to find those good candidates. Um, and what I often find is, like you said about growing the, the business in Zurich, um, it, it's kind of like you can find people to a certain number and then the second you're going to start to grow, it then becomes a bit more difficult. Uh, you've got candidates coming through from the universities, but they don't have as much experience. Yeah. And that's where people in our industry can then come in and, and, and yeah. help and provide our expertise in a way. Yeah, so um, uh, for example, I've been looking for a technical advisor, uh, someone who has experience leading an engineering organization that is potentially hundreds of people, yeah. someone who has deployed machine learning at scale, uh, and has been really hard to find, especially mm. in Zurich. So I may have found a person, and we'll know soon because we're, we're discussing with her. She's yeah. Really, she's, she's quite impressive. Yeah. Um, but these, these profiles, for example, are quite difficult to find. Yeah. Um, and yes, and these, these are cases where you guys can help. Definitely. Yes. Yep. 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 No, I, can, I completely agree. I think what's been easier for you guys as well to, to grow, I think, uh, is your product and what you guys do and kind of like your, your ethos because people want to join you. I think mm -hmm. if the product wasn't quite as exciting, um, you didn't have the content you have and things like that, I think then you would have found it a bit more difficult to find people naturally. Yeah. Um, but no, it's a good thing for, for you guys. Um, that's the next thing I was going to move on to was the office in Lisbon and everything. And um, I think from, from our side, we, we see this quite a lot now, that businesses in Zurich have kind of like their headquarters in Zurich, and then they open an office, I was going to say in Barcelona, for example, mm -hmm. in Lisbon, in Budapest, yep. in Kiev I've seen before, and things like that. So. No, I, I definitely get that. Um, if, for example, you had the option to find a full stack developer or a front end developer for Zurich or for Lisbon, would you have preferred to have people here? Not necessarily. It really depends what this person is going to work on yeah. and how we see that their role would develop. Mm -hmm. uh, and right now, there's more for need in Lisbon just because we're working on the product side, we're working on the deployment side. And people are needed there, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, but also, to me, there isn't much of a difference. Um, whether the person works in Zurich or Lisbon or New York or essentially anywhere, because people can also work remotely. Um, the idea is that Auto Portugal is just another branch, the same way Auto Switzerland yeah. is, and yeah. Auto Inc. in the US is also another branch, it just happens to be the headquarters. Yeah. Um, but it's not like we're not outsourcing development. Uh, it's just it's another office, and right now we don't have anyone permanently in San Francisco. So it's New York, Zurich, and Lisbon mm -hmm. as a sort of golden triangle. Yeah. So people can be anywhere. Yeah. 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 No, that's cool. Um, you've recently received some funding. Yeah. Um, I, I see a, a kind of a, a link to that online and had a look. So congratulations for that. Thanks. Do you know how you're using it and what you're going to do with it now? Oh, I know how we're using every cent. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes. Um, yes. So, so very, very pragmatically, pragmatically, we're using this to uh, strength, build and strengthen uh, our sales, uh, our integration, deployment and sales uh, capacity yep. with a focus on New York for sales and Lisbon for product, mm -hmm. essentially. And this is really the goal for 2020. Now we have technology that works. Yep. Um, and we have early indication of product market fit, so we need to iterate on our product, uh, we need to acquire more customers, and unlock this virtuous cycle between, uh, between customers and products so that you make the product incrementally better and more people want it, and so you can make the product better because you have more feedback, etc. Yeah. Uh, and so really what unlocks uh, PMF product market fit. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the goal. Okay, excellent. And uh, in a way, how long do you think that's going to last? Is that is that was that funding for 2020? Are you then looking for the next step? Are you looking for more investors? Well, you're kind of always looking for funding. Yeah. Um, as a startup founder, 
Um, we know that well, it all depends on revenue, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you make more money, you can uh, last longer. Yeah. Um, we're not, unfortunately, we're not quite at the stage where we can claim to be profitable. Mm -hmm. um, in which case, it's, it's much easier. It's also much easier to raise capital. Yes. yes. Um, so <coughs> this uh, fundraise should see us through 2020, roughly. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, maybe a bit longer, depending on how revenue goes. Uh, but really, realistically, we should. Uh, raise again in the summer, latest by the end of the summer, probably yeah. 2020. Yeah. 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 Okay. Good luck. Good luck. Thanks. <laughs> um, so when you're growing the business, uh, we've already spoke about kind of like the, the characters you look for in a way and the values um, and technical skills, but as a business, which are more important to you? Or in people? Yeah. Yeah. Their background or their character? If you had to take one rather than the other one, which one would you have? Character. Mm -hmm. Yeah, clearly. I mean, so background, people have academic degrees and stuff and it's good, uh, but what really matters is what they can do and what they can do is, 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 is driven by what they want to do yeah. and what they feel like they can achieve and how they feel they might feel empowered in a given team. And so I'd much rather have someone who's, um, you know, very hungry, who wants to prove themselves, who's who is who wants to learn, often these junior people, um, than someone who knows they know everything uh, and is going to be very good at one particular thing, but won't share very much, won't won't uh, teach and coach the rest of the team, etc. So there's um, there's a bit of a, of a discussion often in tech around the productive asshole, right? The yeah. person, often a guy, <laughs> who's really good technically, but is just being um, not very nice the rest of the team and that's absolutely the profile that we don't want to have on yeah, the team course, yeah. whereas, whereas someone, someone who is a strong or strong enough journalist and can do pretty much everything and can learn from people and especially communicate with people and interact with people uh, this is a profile that we're looking for. yeah no, I completely agree. I think uh, our business, for example, that's something that we kind of focus on. I think I, I work with a lot of businesses and I find it hugely frustrating when I go out, find them some suitable guys, ones that I think are going to fit into the business mm -hmm. in, in terms of their character and their personality. And then almost the first stage is for them to sit down and do a four-hour coding challenge. And you just think, this is just crazy. You're, yeah, you're potentially missing out on someone that could have been great for the business. You're going to miss out on them and make join a competitor. Um, and, and I think that's something that's important for any business, not just startups to do, is to to realise what they need and then to tailor their recruitment process mm -hmm. in regards to that. And I think that's something I can tell you guys would do, but many businesses don't. Yeah, so the coding challenge question is a, is a hard one. Mm. I am against the idea of coding under pressure, especially from scratch. Uh, whiteboard, whiteboard coding is the worst because it's so unrealistic compared to yeah. what you do in the yeah. office. However, there's a need at some point in the hiring process, there's a need to test how confident, how, how comfortable the person is around code, mm -hmm. and especially how they can understand code and, and talk about it. Mm -hmm. So something we have in our hiring process is that where candidates are given a piece of code that might or might not work, um, and so, so some bits work, some bits don't work really, and they ask to go through it, um, and essentially talk us through what they understand, what they see in the code, how it could be improved, and there's a discussion around the complexity of this operation, or the, the readability of the code, etc. And I find that this, so it's still fairly structured, because we give the same test essentially to everyone, um, but it gives enough freedom essentially to the candidate to not get stuck on one particular implementation of one particular problem yeah. and more so it's, it's, it's more similar to what happens in the office really yeah. and I find it's a good way to test people's ability yeah I think that's a good thing I think um, one of the things as well is I think any kind of challenge or coding challenge in my opinion should be done at the office um, I think when people are assigned a test to do that's going to take four hours in their own time everyone has busy lives yeah. depending on what you do people have young children people have got commitments outside of work, whether that's hobbies or sports clubs they're members of or whatever. And to say to someone, you know what, you've got to do your job that you're still committed to, that have no idea you're leaving, and then in, in addition to that, you've got to spend four or five hours on a coding challenge, is, is crazy. 
crazy. Yeah, um, I agree. It's, this is difficult. So essentially, I'm, I, we used to have a data science challenge, mm-hmm. uh, which was around essentially some of the data we have. And I would ask people to book essentially around a day to work on that. Uh, and we tell them you can do it whenever you like. Um, so you get access to material at this time, and then you expect to submit a solution at that time. Uh, I found that there's first it's only it's only a proxy for how good the person is, technically, and also it tended to take quite a bit of time from people's essentially free time, and that's not something you want. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we're moving away from this as well, uh, and moving more towards uh, more structured things that we do in the office. Um, and I think now that I have a bit more feedback on this, I'd say if you give people a data science challenge, then they become de facto a data science consultant, and therefore they should be paid. So yeah, if you get if yeah. you get people to work yeah. half a day or yeah. a full day on a data science task, then you, sh- you should pay them hourly rates for that day. You can argue that, uh, but it's expensive, there's, of course. There's a business that I used to work with in Zurich. And they were quite well known and notorious for getting people to do quite a lot of work um, on a on a trial day, for example. So they'd get in, they'd give them a, a real task that they have or a real issue they have, get them to solve something, uh, and then sometimes give very little feedback. And I had a candidate once that I spoke to who said, I, "I don't know what happened. I doubt he got anything." But he actually sent an invoice for his time. He said, "I never received any feedback." He said, "So because I never received any feedback, I'm hitting them with an invoice to say." I gave you my knowledge, uh, my work, and my time for mm-hmm. that period of time, for those six or seven hours or something, wow, yeah. to not get any feedback at all, um, which is extreme, but it's also an extreme case that he never received any feedback. Well, um, yeah. It, but it, I get what you mean. It actually did happen with me, with the company in Zurich I was interviewing years ago. It was a data science <coughs> challenge as well. And it was quite obvious that the data they gave me was data that came from one of their production systems. Yeah. And that they were trying to find a way to solve their the core problem in their business, essentially, yeah. and trying to find fresh perspectives on it. Yeah. And I didn't mind, and I yeah. did it. Uh, and actually worked, like my approach uh, happened to work quite well. And then we did discuss it in the office. And I said, okay, that, that was nice. Uh, actually, was, we, never, we had never thought of doing it that way. Uh, and I realized then that I had actually brought them value. Yeah, yeah. And I thought, yeah. well, I didn't send them an invoice. Maybe I should have. It's good business. Like, you know, you yeah, interview actually. 10 people and get all their ideas and expertise. Absolutely. <laughs> well, it's a terrible business model, but it's, uh, it's a terrible business idea, <laughs> idea, but it's a very good business model. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. one thing I was going to say uh, in regards to the, the tech challenges, I, I suggested to a business once that surely once someone's worked at a certain level, it, it, it is an element of, uh, is it, is it, is it disrespectful to say to them, you know what, can you do a coding challenge for us? Because surely, if somebody's got to a certain level in their career, they, they've got to be able to have done that in order to get there. Yeah, and also the way they do it is not necessarily the way you would do it. I get that, And yeah. so you might misjudge their abilities. So I, all, I would also say, uh, if you're not hiring someone to what, specifically code most of their time, mm-hmm. um, then there's less of a reason to give them a coding challenge, a coding exercise. Yep. If the coding exercise is, um, say, sort of open enough, like you can, you can uh, assess the ability of the person again to think, think and articulate the reasoning about a particular problem, which is expressed in code, but it, can, it could be expressed in different ways, then it's still a very good thing to do. And um, at Google, for example, you know, Google to use our Famous, like a hundred stages. Anyways, yeah. <laughs> and uh, for example, um, like research scientists, people who are going to lead a research team within a research division, when they come in, they often have academic backgrounds, they're professors, uh, they still have to take the exact same test, very similar test essentially to what a junior software engineer would do. Yeah. Um, and the, the reason is that, or the reasoning is that everyone can be compared on an, on an equal footing. Mm-hmm. And I find that this is okay, uh, but I don't think it's something I would do. Yeah. Uh, from a, a certain level of expertise, I'd say it has a lot to do with what the feeling you get and the feeling they get for you, etc. Which actually leads me to the next point, uh, which is that interviews, by and large, suck. Yeah. Uh, they just, yeah. do, in my opinion, they just don't work. Yeah. They are one of the worst 
they're just a really bad way to assess how good a particular person is going to be for a particular position. Um, unfortunately, we don't really have something better. Well, I suppose, I agree. Um, I'd much prefer it if people just hire people rather than interview them. <laughs> yeah, that'd be better. But um, I think, in a way, maybe don't look at it as an interview, maybe look at it as an introduction. So that interview, what, what an interview essentially is, is someone meeting someone, introducing themselves to them, telling them about themselves, but I suppose what's important is in more of a relaxed way, yeah. and then move on to right, that this is the office, this is who the guys are, this is what. So they're, they're, they're seeing kind of the environment more, you're kind of introducing them to the business in more of a natural way. Absolutely, so the, the interview is especially sort of the formal part of the interview is, uh, is an introduction, the way to clear the bar, for the candidate to clear the bar and yeah. move on to the later stages which have to do with the company, the team, etc. But at the end of the day, you also have limited, you have limited bandwidth in terms of how many candidates you can, you can uh, show the office and, uh, yeah. and uh, how many candidates you can, you can think of uh, onboarding. So you have to decide very quickly on very few people. Um, and interviews are just not the very good way to do that. Unfortunately, yeah. again, there's no other way because there's just so many people out there and it's easy to fake uh, say, a set of technical abilities on a CV, of course. And actually, it's not so hard to fake technical ability also uh, in an interview. Yeah, um, and essentially, you're trying to, it's kind of like a marriage, in, for me, like, you're trying to, like, you, you don't get married, uh, like, a day after meeting your, your future partner. Yeah. You have this period in which you get to know each other, you understand how aligned you are with them, and after a time, uh, you say, okay, now I want to come into you and you only as a person. Yeah. Um, well, to me, like a uh, work relationship is very much the same. You're going to work for years, often with a person, and you're asked to make a judgment about them um, in hours only, and that's really hard. Um, but, but again, there's no better way except recommendations. Yeah. When it's people I trust, and it can be people at Otto or outside, and who tell me, look, I've worked with this person, and he or she is amazing, and you should talk to them, uh, then I always do it. Yeah. I always take some of my time to just have coffee and sort of understand where they are, even yeah. when they're not looking for a job, mm -hmm. uh, but they're just interested to chat. And um, and I found that this is the best way essentially to hire people. People who can yeah. recommend it by people you trust, they tend to be very good people, very yeah. good hires. Yeah, no, I agree. I think uh, I was told something once when I was interviewing for our business and hiring for our company. And this is a, a good way of looking at it, where you should look for reasons to hire somebody rather than reasons to not hire. And an interview, a lot of the time, ends up being a, almost like a, a hunt for a reason to yeah. not hire that person. Whereas what you should be doing is looking for reasons why you should hire them, yeah. because that's ultimately the positive side they're going to bring to the business, and then anything else can be worked on. Absolutely, and by a sense, the interview process is geared towards uh, finding ways, finding reasons to not hire the yeah. person because you end up having such a large wide funnel, you have hundreds of applications sometimes for a position mm -hmm. uh, and you just have to find ways to uh, peel essentially this big potato in a way um, and, and so remove people from the funnel and this is just by finding this one thing that you can take and say, and let's say, well, this person won't, won't be the right person for the job. And you never know, of course. Yeah. Um, but so it's just the way we do interviews. So I agree with you. It should be like, I would, I would love to work with this person for this and this and that reason, uh, but it ends up being the opposite. I've often, uh, when I've interviewed people, I've always asked just a couple of questions where, like you say, people can lie in an interview, people can exaggerate things, they can almost be a version of themselves that they think they should be for that interview. And then I simply just say to people, right, forget about work, what do you do in your own life, what do you like doing? And instantly they relax, they start talking about something they're passionate about and you get to see who they really are. Uh, and then I often, was one strange thing, I often say, uh, tell me something about you that not many people know. Um, and instantly again, you get to really understand that person and get to see a different side of them. Yeah. So these, these specific questions is something I've asked people uh, because thinking was a really cool question to ask and stuff and I found that some people react well to it, some people yeah. just react yeah. a bit weirdly because they think okay it's another challenge etc and it's difficult uh, and you're right so you need to get people to sort of leave the interview mode and just talk about yeah. themselves, about who they are, what they like. 
I find this to be difficult often. So I was last week I was in uh, in Toulouse uh, mentoring young young founders, mm -hmm. and one person asked me like, okay, so how do you judge um, the 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 chances that a founder has to build a successful business and to uh, to execute on a on a vision and a mission? Um, and I said, uh, well, what I would do is I would take this person out for beers. Yeah. And I would, it's just, it's just my way of doing things, you know, yeah, I like yeah. drinking beers. I mean, sorry, that's, that didn't come out right. <laughs> um, so we take the person yeah. out for beers because I think it, it doesn't have to be alcohol, of course. It can be in a, yeah. you know, just in a relaxed setting and just talk about things. I like to talk about the world, yeah. humanity, our future, and just talk about crazy things and see, see, see what drives them, see what they have inside. Yeah. Because it goes way beyond, oh, I know Haskell. Or uh, okay, I've done this and I've studied there, and so and it's through this. And unfortunately, it's a very unstructured thing because I don't have a list of things that I want to tick mm -hmm. and say. Okay, so the person has that. Um, but I find that having this free conversation mm -hmm. uh, actually does help a lot. I agree. I think, uh, like you said about you and Tio, where you share your same kind of ethos and outlook on on life in a way and different topics. Um, I think that's important because quite often you can end up sitting with people in, in an office who have a completely different outlook on life to you. Which is fine. Which is fine. Um, but sometimes it can be difficult if you don't have enough in common with somebody. Yeah. Where you have very different personalities and it can make it tricky. Yeah, but I There's think a fine line. that through friction great things are born. Yeah. And so on, on the team, for example, I have a fairly strong personality, it's something I'm aware of, uh, and people I work with, uh, so team leads like on this team, they all have very diff different personalities to mine. Um, and in particular, I can think of a couple of people, one person in particular, who is very different to me. Yeah. And we often disagree on topics, on the best way to do things, yeah. but we also respect each other, I think, very much. And because we listen to each other, and we find solutions that I think we or we find trade-offs. Um, we find ways to build things and solve problems that we wouldn't find uh, if we were to stay in our respective mindsets. Yeah. So th I think that can be a really good thing. Yeah. Cool. I agree. I agree. Um, one thing I wanted to move on to was Switzerland as a whole, and, and yeah, I suppose yeah, more importantly Zurich with, uh, for, for this chat. I've noticed over the years, so I've worked the Swiss market now for nearly eight years, and I have colleagues who work different markets, so Germany and Berlin in particular, mm -hmm. if you like. And in Switzerland, lots of businesses seem to have much smaller growth plans than businesses in other parts of, of the world and, yeah. and Europe, for example. Um, why do you think that is, to start off with? Uh, it's a mentality thing. I yeah, think it may have to do with um, history. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm not wrong, Switzerland has a Protestant history. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, so I may, maybe just scratch this because I'm not entirely sure. But Switzerland has a history <coughs> of uh, generalizing, but being uh, neutral, yeah. a bit conservative, and um, to follow its own pace. And so, and the result of this is, is good in many ways. You find that people are very understated mm -hmm. uh, when they study here, when they work here. Often they're really good technically, for example, uh, but they're not going to boast about how good they are, etc. Mm -hmm. um, and that can be a really good thing. However, when it comes to building a, a new thing and a bold thing, uh, and, 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 and crafting a vision <coughs> and executing essentially on, on a mission, uh, it doesn't always have to be good. Mm -hmm. So essentially, because um, I, I know Switzerland quite a bit and the US quite a bit as well, yeah. um, if you think you can do X uh, in Switzerland, you'll often say, well, we're quite confident that we can achieve half of X. Yeah. And if things go well, we might do 2x. Yeah. In the US, if you think you can do x, you can say, yeah, we'll have 10x done by uh, yeah, 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 half yeah, next year, yeah, yeah. Uh, for example. And so there's really a big difference in terms of how people 
sell things and sell themselves. Um, and there's good and bad uh, in both cultures and yeah. different ways of doing thing, things. Uh, but clearly Switzerland is very special in that respect. I agree. I think um, there's, there's some startups in other markets and other countries that go bust very quickly. They, they go too big too soon. Um, on the other side, there are some who become enormously successful very, very quickly because they've kind of gone for it a bit more in a way. Uh, and in the Swiss market, what I do see is uh, over my time working in this market, normally when someone joins a business, that company is very certain that they're the right person for them. They, they like to make sure rather than take a risk in a way, um, I find, um, which, which can be difficult for what I do sometimes um, because it can take a long while. But a lot of the time, companies don't want to take any risk. They want to make sure they do everything carefully. So rather than grow by 10 people, they'll grow by three. Um, and they'll make sure that those three hires are spot on, exactly what they need, and that they're going to fit in perfectly. But the growth of that company then is very, very slow. Uh, well, so yeah, I, I agree with you, but I disagree with yep. that way of doing things in general. Yep. Because you might have an idea, it has to do with the unexpected, right, that I talked about earlier. You might have an idea of how good a person is for, for a job, mm -hmm. and you hire them, and then either you realize that it's not exactly what you had in mind, because it never is, or anyway, things happen, uh, regardless of how the person is, things happen in your company in a way that you didn't expect, and so you realize that you actually, you, you, you need to adopt a different mindset, and it is the uh, unplanned that works best in some ways, and so, um, you have to just stay open, mm -hmm. remain open to the fact that things will change. And when you hire a person, you're never sure that it's going to work well. So it's, it's the person's job to make things work. But it's also your yeah. job uh, to adapt and to make the company adapt to that person so that you grow together. Yeah. And, and then as to your point regarding risks, uh, so yeah, companies growing too, too fast, too soon, etc. Uh, and for, I agree, and in tech startups it's very much the case, and it has to do, um, by and large, with the VC world and the fact that incentives have changed quite a bit, and the distribution of returns mm -hmm. in VC has um, has got more and more skewed, so that essentially most VCs will look for outsized returns on very few investments. Yeah. If they're going to get it wrong. Uh, they need to know as fast as possible, uh, so they need to get the business to iterate as fast as possible on their idea, and if possible, make yeah. it. But they don't. Want, they don't want small businesses. Yeah. They want, with a certain number of investments, they want a very small fraction of them to be enormously successful. Mm -hmm. um, and that has to do with the pressure that they get from their own LPs. So their their own investors essentially has to do returns that they they need to generate to beat the market. Um, and in the end, this pressure is sort of carry it downstream onto the founders, and the founders may have an idea of um, how to create a nice and sustainable and interesting business, but actually they are forced often, and it's fine, it's just part of the game, yeah. but they are forced to do things as big as possible, so essentially go big or go home. Yeah. And yeah. that is very much the mentality, and that is not something that I think is very healthy for anyone involved. Yeah, yeah, no, I, uh, I, I get that. We, uh, we touched upon, obviously, uh, the Swiss kind of mindset, typically or traditionally, if you like. Um, I, when I first started working in the Swiss market, I used to work with businesses who only wanted, at the time, local candidates who spoke Swiss German. That was, that was something that we, we knew and, and used to kind of really struggle with to a certain extent. Over the past eight years, that's changed massively now. Oh, yeah? There are a lot of international businesses out there um, who hire people from all over the world are extremely diverse. I think that's a good thing because I think that that kind of uh, diversity now will change that kind of mindset. Mm -hmm. um, I think it will make businesses a little bit more imaginative or adventurous in a way. Open, yeah. Uh, a little bit more open, yeah, um, which I think is good. Um, so that's something that we've noticed and something that would lead me on to the next point of discussion in a way. And we touched upon Zurich. Before we started this filming, we uh, discussed Zurich, and I said how, for me, I've seen Zurich in different ways, winter, summer, and 
even though Zurich is ranked as being the, the top place to live in the world for quality of life and everything, I don't think it's well known as that kind of destination that, where uh, you could go on holiday in the summer, yeah. in a way. I don't think people look at it that way. I think many people from different European countries wouldn't necessarily view Zurich as a city that they're going to relocate to. So why, why would somebody move to Zurich, in your opinion? Are you asking why don't people know Zurich more? Or uh, what could draw people to Zurich? What draws people to Zurich? Okay, yeah. So quality of life. I came to Zurich um, for many reasons, but among the top of the list were the mountains. Mm -hmm. uh, so proximity to a thriving, vibrant academic community. And I yeah. realized there were people um, whose work I knew as a researcher or a very young researcher. Yeah. And I wanted to work with them. And I found that it was a bit of a cluster. I was doing robotics then. A bit of a cluster of excellence, essentially, mm -hmm. in Zurich. Thanks to ETH, the University of Zurich, but in general. So the, the way that the Swiss government encourages innovation. That is one thing. Uh, but also the mountains, because I'm a big outdoors fan, yeah. and uh, living in Zurich, essentially, you can you can get on a train and in 30, 45 minutes be in places where you can climb, you can hike, yes. you can ski in the summer, uh, and just enjoy the outdoors. Also, high quality of life. Uh, we have two rivers in one lake. No, uh, but we, we it, it's nice. It's not a big city. Yeah. I walk. Most everywhere. I'm a bit of a special case because I walk like hours every day. Um, but you can you can pretty much walk anywhere. Yeah. Um, public transportation works really well, um, and it is a very safe place to live in. Um, and of course, everything is really expensive. Uh, but the salaries are all relevant. Yeah. Um, so in in terms of purchasing power, your I mean things are good, especially if you if you go abroad for holiday or something. And so overall. Okay, and also, there's, people think of Zurich, when they do think of Zurich, because it's quite a small place in the end, and it's not on everyone's radar, but they think of Zurich, they see sort of the, what I call the white collar side of it. Yeah. Um, so it's the banks and insurances, etc. And it's just one part of Zurich, and, and arguably, well, it's, it's a pretty big one, uh, but it's not the Zurich I know, for example. Yeah. There's the academic Zurich, which is, again, very vibrant, and many things happen, many ideas get discussed, uh, yesterday I was at a lecture here by a Nobel Prize on climate change and this is the sort of things that you see very often. So you're open to many ideas and lots of influence, intellectual stimulation. And there's also the sort of the alternative, Zurich. So nightlife is really good, there's lots of things happening. I'm not going to compare it to Berlin or London of course, um, but still, um, whatever you like, Especially when in terms of you know electronic music, for example, because I'm, I'm really into electronic music, um, you always find great um, places to go, concerts, events, like a nice crowd in general. Yes. And so there's a there's a mainstream Zurich and the sort of the bit hidden alternative Zurich, and, and both are really interesting in their own ways. That's what I mean. I think um, for me, I touched upon before, but we had a trip a few years back now where we um, we brought a, a large group of us out. So we had two Swiss teams at Darwin at the time. Um, and we, we traveled out here to do two days worth of meetings. And there was a French airstrike on the last day, so our flight was canceled. Um, so everyone was kind of like disappointed that we weren't going back. And then very, very quickly thought, actually, this is quite good. We're, we're stuck here now. And it was in end of July, like 33, 35 degrees, something like that. Um, so. Uh, my boss at the time was like, right, let's arrange some more business meetings for the guys for the next day. And we were like, absolutely not. <laughs> we are going to go to the shops and we're going to buy some swim shorts and we're going to head down to the lake. And I'd never, I'd been to Zurich before in the summer when it was really hot, uh, but I was dressed inappropriately for that weather to, for business meetings predominantly. Um, so I got to see Zurich in a different light and we went and bought some swim shorts and we went down to the lake. Um, and we went swimming, we went paddleboarding, and, and it was incredible. It was a great day. I have no doubt that every person there that day felt more of a connection to Zurich and Switzerland, having done that than the meeting with businesses for certain. Um, but it was great, and I'd never viewed it in that way. And I was thinking, this is incredible. There were guys turning up in suits, getting changed, waiting yes, 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 for their suit in the locker and going swimming for an hour. Yeah. Um, and he's like, this is amazing. We, 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 we don't have to have people do this like over lunch. 
You see people yeah. like, who go swimming in the river and yeah. they take off their, their suit and they, they go and do this. And because it's such a small place, and because it's very clean and uh, like the, the yeah. river, the lake, the lake is, all of these are very clean. It makes it possible and very enjoyable. Um, so when you come back in the summer, yeah. I'll show you some cool places to go swimming yeah. and to Sounds good. after work. Uh, because to me, this is very great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I agree. I think it's a. Uh, an amazing place, summer and winter, and uh, and summer. I never thought I'd say it, but I have two young children, and I, I was looking into there's campsites down on the lakes uh, on the way down to Kour. I love Kour; it's an amazing place. And uh, the train journey on the way down there, you go through uh, is it Lake uh, Valens, yes, um, and there's like campsites by the side of the lake, and you look and you think like, why why go to a, a, a beach resort in Spain? Where you've got salt water and sand, where you could go, and you've got the mountains around you, and and the lake. Camped there a lot, and yeah. yeah, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It looks amazing. So yeah, it's definitely on my on my bucket list to do. So um, no, really good. Thanks for your time, Nico. Awesome. Uh, I'll hold you to that in the summer. I'll come along, and we'll. Uh, hopefully, the barbecue area is, is sorted then, so we can we can join you for that. We'll play ping pong. Yeah, we'll go swimming. I'm good as well. So yeah, have to, have to practice more. <laughs> Excellent. Cheers, Nico.